we have had some talks about music without rhythm, and I'm going to take us deep into rhythm with this talk. Can everyone hear me? I have just gotten off of an airplane, and my ears are stopped up. So uh, <laughs> somebody raise a hand if you can't hear me back there. OK, so um, I want to talk about dance and some of the um, contemporary presentations of flamenco dance that we've seen. Um, this is La Otra Orilla, which is out of a company out of Canada. And they performed in Atlanta at Georgia State University's Rialto Center for the Arts a couple of years ago. And they were uh, widely acclaimed for their work in the avant-garde. I know some people don't like this word avant-garde, but we're going to use that today a little bit. Um, and and they're some of the, or, or one of the companies that is producing uh, more contemporary flamenco works these days. And um, you see them uh, with their guitarist rolling in a chair here. Um, we see contemporary dancers in, in flamenco uh, rolling in paint, uh, dancing in water, dancing in silence, and dancing in powder. And as all of these expressions, as all of these interpretations are shocking and surprising, um, they bring out one of my favorite debates in flamenco dance, which is the debate between the tradition and the future, the avant-garde, um, the, the, the tradition, the, the purists on the tradition side want to say that the avant-garde is the end of flamenco, and the, I've been told by the avant-garde, it is the future. So um, <laughs> there in, <laughs> there in uh, my studies at Georgia State, um, I was introduced to some theories that I really enjoyed uh, looking at while thinking about this debate. And um, my professor, Elena Del Rio Para, is the person who led me through this journey. So I'm going to share with you these theories. These are the theories of Severo Sardui, who is a Cuban writer and arts critic. And he found himself in Madrid very briefly in 1960 to study, and then did not return to Cuba. Um, his studies were cut short in 1960 uh, there in Madrid, and he re relocated to Paris. And after that, he spent the rest of his life pretty much traveling around Europe and um, coming back and forth to Paris. And he talks about, he brings the shape of the ellipse into the studies of Baroque art. And so here we have El Intercambio de Princesas. This is by Rubens from the Baroque period. And we see, I, I was always taught, there's an oval on the top, ellipse and oval there. There's an oval on the top and an oval on the bottom to divide the two, the painting into two pieces. But Sardui suggested that indeed there's only one ellipse and it has two centers of focus. And this is in contrast to Renaissance and Classicism, uh, where we have a circle with a single focus. Um, the circle being perfection, and the ellipse being not perfection, that pearl of Baroque. And here we have La Comida de Simon. And in this case, this, excuse me, previously here, this is what Sardui referred to as positive focus, a double positive focus because you have one center in the top of the ellipse and another center in the bottom. And here we have what he called a negative focus, because you have in what would be the bottom of the painting uh, one center of focus that draws your attention to it while the other side recedes. And this is where I got to thinking about flamenco compas and contratiempo during my uh, medieval literature class and <laughs> our, our class at Georgia State. And so here we see the double negative um, focus in contratiempo. The beats, the tierras, as the musicians call them, one, two, three, four, five, six, are on the bottom, and they are receding to the best of my visual uh, representation there. And the, those ands, those contras in between, are standing out. And so contrast this to what you see here, the graphic on the bottom with the circle, where you have triplets, uh, one and a, two and a, three and a, four and a. You see this in a lot of flamenco footwork prior to the 1960s. And then today, it is very standard and a mark of excellence to be able to dance, not only uh, dance the tierras and the contratiempos, but to be able to dance in the contratiempos and base your footwork in flamenco dance in the contratiempos. 
And so therefore, you don't even hit the beat. Those one, two, three, four, five, sixes across the top, you only hit the top beats and even ground your footwork sequence in those. So um, here you have the contra contrast, our classicism, and our Baroque in our flamenco footwork. And Vicente Escudero is one of the first people that I can find performing in uh, video using contratiempo footwork in a manner that relates to this double negative vocalization. And um, before I dig into his work there, I want to talk about the positive focus that he created here. Because he's known for a lot of firsts in flamenco and in the dance world in general. Um, he was one of, or he, he was the first man to begin dancing with his hands raised and to move his, uh, uh, excuse me, move his hands. And um, this is the positive focal, focalization. If you can see the focus in the top, and the focus on the bottom that the raised arm creates in the male alignment there. And then um, we're going to move on to that negative focus there where he was dancing without music, dancing to machine rhythms, and using contratiempo and clustering his footwork. And this is all where we see the idea of one focus uh, receding and another standing out, jumping out at you, just as in the Baroque visual art. So when Vicente Escudero went to create some of his most famous work in Paris, uh, he was the first to dance the Seguidilla in the 1920s. And uh, he chose the Seguidilla because he wanted the most difficult palo to work with so that he could have a playground in which he could try to surprise himself when he created movement, percussive movement in particular, with out regard to the structure of compass. He wanted to be able to move freely without that rigidity of compass. And so I think I'm going to jump ahead here for just a second and then come back. There we are. Here's our word compass. So in flamenco, I've always thought of it in, in three different ways. Compass is a measure, measure of music. Um, tells you how many beats are in the, the measure. Um, it is also the pattern of rhythmic accents that colors Apollo, so that you know, yes, Alegrias has 12 beats, and Solia has 12 beats, and Fandengos has 12 beats, but those rhythmic patterns make those 12 beats completely different. And also, compas, they will say, oh, you have great compas. So that is also a good sense of rhythm. So if you look at the second point here, that pattern of rhythmic accents, that's the idea that Escudero was trying to escape when he created um, work in Paris, in particular when he was working in his Segrilla. And I'm going to take just a moment here to stop and pull up a video so you can see an idea of what I'm talking about with this clustering. Uh-oh. Eliza, I may need you here. Oh, no, here we are. OK, so this is actually Allegrius. <laughs> This is actually an Alegrias, um, not a Seguidilla. We don't have a video of him, um, of Escudero dancing Seguidilla. Um, you have to really speak into the mic. Okay. Okay, thank you. The, we don't have video of Escudero dancing Seguidilla, but we have this great video um, of him dancing in Alegrias. And I want you to watch, not only see if you can find those contratiempos that he uses, but also look for those clusters, um, those, those bursts of footwork that seem to come out of um, sil not necessarily silence, but a subdued uh, run of footwork.
All right, and I'm going to stop Mr. Escudero there. All right, so you see some idea of how he's using contratiempos, um, not just in a run. There, there, were, there are sound recordings of dancers like Carmen Amaya using contratiempos in runs, but not clustering them as much as, as or, or not clustering them in the way that Escudero was. And so he gets some credit um, for as, as a pioneer in that sense with these contratiempos. Okay, so like I said, that was the Alegrias um, compas that he was dancing to. So I want to take a look at the ellipse in the general flamenco compas and, um, and then draw a connection into the Seguiria compas so you guys can see where um, this super Baroque idea comes in in the work of, of Escudero and, and why he was looking at, at Seguiria for this work. Um, so we have here the flamenco compas written f in musical terms kind of musical terms because really if you put together a 6-8 and a 3-4 you come up with five beats but in flamenco we've changed that over to 12 beats and so the idea is um, this is a general idea about flamenco compas um, it, it's very basic the the compas has its um, nuances in the, the different palos so just generally looking at the idea of half the compas um, being suppressed and the other half being visible you might think that the first half the compas would be danced quietly, and the second half of the compas might have a burst of footwork. And that is what would stand out um, from the two halves. And this is linked back to some African music traditions where when you put the two halves together in this emiolia, one is going to overpower the other. Not necessarily overpower, but stand out um, from the other. And, oh, well, let's see. I think I need to get back into my presentation. Yes, okay, now this, here we go. So then when you take a look at this in terms of the Seguirilla compas, I call the Seguirilla compas the emiolia turned inside out um, because you could start counting it on eight and then get, on, get in all 12 of those beats, but really in flamenco we count it to five, but not those five beats that the musicians would count from that combination of six, eight, and three, four time. And so here you see we have the visible, um, the visible portion of the compas in the beginning and the suppressed portion of the compas in the end. And if you take a look at it in terms of an ellipse, you can see where the focus, what would be downstage here, <laughs> um, is the half that stands out and the focus that is upstage is the half that is repressed. And if you, those of you who play Segarilla or dance it, know you have un, do, tre, cuatro, cinco, this kind of thing. Okay, so um, this, is, this is Sardui's Ellipse and Escudero. And then we have Israel Galvan, um, who is maybe our, our modern day um, representation of Escudero um, because he's, we all know that he has studied the work of Escudero and he's also uh, remounted some of his work. Let me play a little video. Linda, how am I doing on time? Um, you have about seven more minutes. Great. I'm going to play a little bit of a video. This is interesting. Okay. All right, and I'm going to stop that there. So this was a project that Galvan worked in 2010. This is Segedia 1938. And so he worked to remount a Segedia that uh, Escudero would have performed in Paris in 1938. And then later in 2012, I believe, if I don't have my dates mistaken, Galvan performed er, or debuted La Curva, which I got to see in Jerez in 2012. Actually, I think Galvan debuted this in the same year, in 2010, and then I saw it in 2012 in, in Jerez. And let me get the right time code, because I want you to watch for that Sigurdia from 1938.
And so Galvan brings in all the isms of modernism, cubism, expressionism, um, help me out. Um, they're, they're there. And what you can't see, s surrealism, yes, yes. And what you can't see here is to Galvan's left sit Bobote and Ines, Ines Bacan. The pianist here is Sylvia Coavazier. Ooh, if I, if I can say that. And so the idea here is that um, Galvan is between the tradition and the future, uh, dueling it out in what I uh, took to be a pile of flour so that we could see him also intertwined flamenquin in the life of Andalusia, and that flamenco is as intertwined in Andalusia as he is in the art form and everything is struggling together, battling it out between the tradition and the future. And there is the ellipsis of Sardui, that when you have a statement and then dot, 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 and you finish the statement, something in there is going to overpower uh -huh. one. And here is Galvan looking for, I don't know if he's looking for one to overpower the other. He said that the combination of Ines Bacan and Sylvia Quavassier would be the perfect female flamenco artist uh -huh. <laughs> in an interview. So maybe he's not looking to overpower. He's looking for a fusion, a true fusion. Um, OK, so with just a little bit of time, I'm going to show you um, a really fascinating thing that I found in this research. And that is Sardoui's poem, Segedidia, which he published in the book named uh, titled Flamenco in 1969. And this poem and his theories about the ellipse and the ellipsis were published after he would have been in Paris, after he would have seen the work of Escudero in Paris. And if he had not seen Escudero in Paris, then the practices of Escudero, the contratiempo, the clustering, would have been on their way to becoming mainstream. And so. I think I'm going to look into uh, the moment when Sardoui and Escudero are actually in the same room. But can you see the Seguirilla compas in this poem? The poem is about um, slot machines. And it was written at a time when casinos were uh, the rage in Cuba. And so this poem is obviously informed by Maid Yarmé. And with the, the fracturing and the fragmentation in the poem, there's some uh, uh, metaphor of life in Cuba with the casinos there. Mm -hmm. I would like to say in the 1960s and 70s, there's also some metaphor about flamenco in there, looking at what was happening with the art form um, and the changes that it was going through with the political and social movements mm -hmm. of the time. In the end of last year, Galvan began a project to, oh, do I have this in here? Yes. Here is just a little fragment of Mayarme's poem, A Throw of the Dice. And in November of 2016, Galvan began a project to dance this poem, but not to dance the poem. Um, Blood Thiers, did I say his name correctly? Help me if I didn't. Um, rewrote this poem in the 60s. This is from the late 1800s. And he rewrote the poem in the 60s in a series of black lines um, to represent the positive and the negative of the word on the paper. And at the end of last year, Galvan danced that positive negative, again, the double focus. And um, then there is an author who's going to take the dance and write it into words. And so we're going to see this thing come full circle. And I do want to go back here and draw your attention to it, that this is Sardoui's positive negative, making a body out of poetry on the, the page. And he did it to Segedida because he wanted to find a way that people would not pay attention to the words but get lost in the rhythm, mm -hmm. much the way flamenco circles are expected <coughs> to become lost in the rhythm uh, when they individually experience the same emotion together, united through song, dance, and guitar. Thank you. <laughs>